Welcome back to Media 7. We're examining the implications of the still unfolding scandal around Rupert Murdoch and his media companies. Even many of Murdoch's detractors will acknowledge one thing about him. He is perhaps the last great champion of the newspaper in the internet age. Sam Mulgrew wonders what life might be like without him. With the Times catering to the establishment and... All aboard me hearties and play Yo-Ho Bingo in the sun and the news of the world! Yo -ho bingo. The salacious sun, Rupert Murdoch's British newspapers dominate both ends of the spectrum. Extrapolate the sun's 2.6 million daily circulation to an American-sized market and the paper would sell an outrageous 13 million copies a day. Murdoch is a man who takes the hands-on approach. Mr. Murdoch, I don't know if you've got any views about it. Yes, I think that the, uh, we've got to lead with it, obviously. He's dominating Australia, controlling 70% of the country's newspaper circulation. 170 print titles, including the big morning dailies in every state capital except Perth, the only national paper, nearly half the AAP and a quarter of pay TV service Foxtel. In Rupee's adopted home, his holdings include too many quadrupeds to name, America's best-selling newspaper, The Wall Street Journal, as well as the massive Dow Jones & Co. He even owns the Papua New Guinea Post Courier. What's my happy place? He's involved here too, owning 43.7% of the $2 billion animal Sky TV, which returned $120 million last year. He's got a porn star-like grip on the love handles of the press, but with inquiries coming out his ears, what would happen to newspapers if Rupert Murdoch was knocked off his perch? Sam Mulgrew there. Not sure about that last metaphor. Uh, I'm joined now by former New Zealand Herald editor Gavin Ellis. Welcome, Gavin. Hello. So, last great champion of newspapers. Is that a fair assessment of Murdoch? I think it probably is a, a fair assessment. I'm sure there are others who, who are in love with newspapers, but in terms of the power that he has in the newspaper business, yeah, I think he probably is the last of the champions. And we can't take that away from him. He has been a very strong supporter of print journalism. Uh, even Alan Rusbridger, the editor of The Guardian, the, the newspaper which has pursued them more than any other, has uh, in the past acknowledged his debt and every, everyone in newspapers' debt to Murdoch for forcing the pace of technological change in newspapers in the 1980s. Yeah, he did that. I mean, he, he broke the power of the print unions and uh, we all, uh, I think, owe him a debt for that because it placed control of production back in the hands really of journalists where it, it should be and, and now resides. So yeah, we, we owe him a debt for that. Do we owe him an overall debt for everything? No. Uh, quite clearly we've seen that the man exercises power to excess and uh, brooks little opposition. So he has too much power. I mean, he's not alone. Berlusconi did the same in, in Italy, but uh, in the English-speaking world, he's without parallel. We've seen indications that some of uh, News Corporation's shareholders have become a bit leery of this. Uh, the possibility remains that he may be toppled from his own company. Uh, what will happen then? Well, we can, we can only speculate, but I think that we can, we can say with absolute certainty that James Murdoch will not be his successor. It's highly unlikely that Lachlan, the other son, will succeed him. Uh, he has had problems in Australia with one tell and so on. The only Murdoch uh, really who is unsullied in, in all of this is Elizabeth. Uh, now she, she has a very good reputation in television production, but is she up to running the empire? I doubt. I mean, she's not Murdoch's nominator, nominated successor. That's Chase Carey, the, uh, the president of, of News Limited. Uh, an American with a, a television background, not a print background. So does that mean that, that the newspapers will be let go or just simply de-emphasised? Because they're, they're, they're quite clearly not making the money that the television does. Well, so, I mean, the Sun still makes a lot of money. Other parts of the empire are being cross-subsidised by it. Uh, I don't think the, the Times makes very much money. But Murdoch has been prepared to support it 
uh, and, uh, and those lesser parts of the, the print empire. He has supported with the, the more profitable ones. Will his successors be prepared to do that sort of cross-subsidy? I doubt very much. Uh, but will it mean devolving uh, their, their uh, print assets to somebody else? I don't think that that's likely to happen in its entirety. The, the sun is going to be there for quite some time. It's, it's profitable. It has a huge circulation. So why sell it? Um, but more importantly, I think we've got to stop thinking about the, the medium on which the journalism is printed and start to see the journalism as something that News Corporation can use across its various platforms. And I think that's where the real value of their journalism lies. They might have less attachment to newspapers, but they will not lose their attachment to journalism in its various guises, and it runs from the Times through to, to Fox News. So would news be interested in if, as seems likely, APN, your former employer, puts up some of its New Zealand print assets for sale? Do they have any appetite for print? Yet? Uh, I don't think that they would be in the business of buying more newspapers. Um, what they might be interested in is buying, as I just said, this journalism asset, which now spreads across various platforms, be it television, radio, the web, tablets, which I think is going to be the successor to the print product. Um, the, the journalism is what they would be buying. Uh, but also there's, there's still a substantial advertising market there. And remember, at the end of the day, although Murdoch characterises himself as a former journalist, he's a businessman. It's bottom line stuff that he's, he's ultimately interested in. And his involvement with power politics, for example, has been to further his commercial ends, about far more than his journalistic ambitions. And finally, what do you think the impact of the Leveson inquiry will be? Uh, I'm a bit of a sceptic, because I've, I've looked at the, the effect that past royal commissions on the press have had, and they've come out with some strong, sometimes watered down recommendations, but very few of their recommendations have had lo long-term effects. So the Leveson inquiry, I think, will have the effect of reducing any wrongdoing on the part of journalists. I think that they will, will know that they're not going to get away with that. But will it lead to a, a change of the, the, the whole landscape? I would be doubt, doubtful. At any rate, it's been fun to watch. Thank you, it has been Gavin fun. Ellis. Yes. <laughs> now, before we go, a little glamour, the kind that might make you ill. Long before there was Hello, there was Homes and Gardens with Hitler. This 1938 issue of the magazine featured a fawning spread with Herr Hitler just weeks before the horrors of Kristallnacht, the beginning of the Holocaust and the final solution. Who would have thought the man responsible for the deaths of millions when all soft over cut flowers? Vogue magazine nearly passed out with excitement over Syrian First Lady Asma al-Assad. Asma, says Vogue, is glamorous, young and very chic, the freshest and most magnetic of First Ladies. Everyone knows roses can't grow in the desert, which makes Asma a kind of miracle in killer heels. A rose in the desert appeared at the beginning of the Syrian pro-democracy uprising in January 2011. The Israeli barbaric assault on innocent civilians has been horrific. Since then, more than 5,000 people have been killed in President Bashar al-Assad's brutal crackdown. The Syrian government paid a PR firm $25,000 for this loved-up spread. Syrians have suffered oppression for decades. The country has operated under emergency law since 1963. But that's such a buzz colour. Besides, Vogue says, Asma al-Assad is breezy, conspiratorial and fun. She also happens to be complicit in tyranny. Vogue did pull the story off its website, but in the age of the internet, there's no hiding. Sarah Daniel there. It's hard to believe that Vogue story ran in 2012. And that's our show. Thanks to Brian Gould and Gavin Ellis for their time and to you for your, for your time spent watching. We'll be back with Media 7 at the same time next week. Until then, goodbye. <laughs>